Hi, I'm Jackson Bird, and today I want to share how I legally changed my name and gender marker. Just, you know, in case it's like helpful for you to know as well. By the way, welcome to winter videos. Got warm sweaters and no more natural light for filming until like... April. Thanks, New York. So I came out as a guy in 2015 and told everyone my new first name then. That was the name that I was using socially and publicly, and still am, but I didn't end up changing my name legally for another year and a half because I had to decide on my middle name first. And if you're curious how I picked any of my names, you can go watch the videos that I made on that, which are linked right there. <laughs> Part of what pushed me to finally change it, apart from how annoying it was to have my ID mismatch the one that like security guards or hotel lobbies have been given by people that I was meeting with, or have a bouncer see a gender on my ID other than the one that I looked like, or having to tell people that I was like signing contracts with to use my old name, apart from all of that, I finally decided to do it because of November 9th, 2016. Yeah. Basically, I didn't know how much longer I would be able to change my documents as a transgender person. Fortunately, for now, we still can. Now, how you change your name and gender marker varies from country to country and from state to state. It's made more complicated based on which documents you're trying to change and whether you were born in the same state that you currently live in. For example, I was born in Michigan, but I live in New York. Luckily, I wasn't interested in changing my Michigan-issued birth certificate, and New York State didn't require me to change it in order to change all of my other documents, so for me, the process was simplified. But everything I discuss in this video is how it worked for me in New York State, and is definitely geared towards the process in the United States. The exact things won't hold true for everyone, but hopefully I can shed a little light on a pretty complicated process. Because it is such a complicated process, I chose to work with the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund, whose name change project matches low-income transgender people with attorneys who offer pro bono, aka free, legal name change services. They don't operate everywhere, so check their website to see if your county is included. I'll put a link in the description box. Uh, and if not, I highly recommend talking to your nearest LGBTQ center and seeing what local organizations organizations or resources they can recommend to help you out. You can just look up information or talk to someone who's done it before and piece things together, but it is way easier to have an expert walk you through the process so that you don't have any like nasty surprises come up. Also, this is a good time to mention that I am not a lawyer and nothing I say in this video should be taken as legal advice. I'm just telling you what I did in case it's helpful. So a few weeks after I got in touch with the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund, or Tildif. Does anyone call it Tildif? I always call it Tildif in my head. I'm telling it. I'm gonna call it Tildif for the rest of the video. So a few weeks after I got in touch with Tildif, they let me know I was accepted into the program and gave me some information about the documents I would need to secure ahead of time, which included my birth certificate, current driver's license and social security card, and a letter from my doctor stating his approval of my gender marker change. The requirements for the doctor letter are pretty much the same across the country. It must come from a licensed physician and be on physician's letterhead. You do not have to be on hormones or have had any type of medical procedure. Maybe this has changed by now, but when I did it, your doctor just had to write that they've treated you and you've undergone clinical treatment for a gender change. But if you get all of that, this letter works to change your gender marker on everything from your social security card and passport on down. So after submitting my paperwork, I got matched with an attorney's office and they used my information to draft a name change petition, which I then needed to go into their offices to sign and have notarized. I then asked if I could bring my own notary to the meeting, cause I'm fancy. Actually, one of my good friends happens to be a notary public, and I thought it would be kind of, I don't know, meaningful to include a friend in the process like that. Morning, John. Good morning. <laughs> Where are we going? We're going to work. <laughs> I gotta get my notary stuff. Yeah, to, to go to the attorneys with Fancy. He's gonna notarize my paperwork. Meeting the lawyers was great. Like, it turned out that my attorney had done this a million times with lots of success in getting various fees and other requirements waived. Her and her office were totally proactive in being trans inclusive. Plus, she even had a trans son. It was like a match made in heaven. So the attorney's office then submitted the signed and notarized petition to the courts and we waited to hear back about a court date. Now, usually there is a filing fee of upwards of $200 for the petition, but you can submit a waiver for that, which my attorney did. I don't remember exactly how long it took for the court date to get set. We were also working around holiday closures in December, so I'm not sure about the normal turnover, but eventually my date was set for Friday the 13th. 
what could go wrong? Once I had a court date set, I did the next official step, burning my birth certificate. All right, so it was actually just a copy. I'm not that metal. Like Laura Jane Grace, who I think actually did burn her birth certificate on stage to protest North Carolina's bathroom bill. What a goddess. I was also at a New Year's Eve party where people were burning things they wanted to leave in the past. So like, it wasn't that out of place. It was still kind of cool though. I don't actually care to change my birth certificate unless I have to, which with the new memo from the US Department of Health and Human Services, potentially taking away trans people's ability to change birth certificates, I'm actually starting to think that maybe I should do it now. Like just as a precaution. But as far as my own personal feelings go, I don't feel the need, especially since I don't live in my birth state and like barely ever have. It would be a way more involved process than I personally feel is worth it for me right now. But anyways, on Friday the 13th, I went to court with my attorney. Basically, you have all of your paperwork and you wait to hear if the court will approve your petition and whether or not they're gonna make you publish your name change in the newspaper. So this is a requirement that I think exists to help prevent tax fraud, like not usually done by trans people, but like other people changing their names to get out of taxes or whatever weird thing. But obviously it is a very dangerous requirement for trans people because it's basically like a classified ad in your local newspaper for everyone to see that you're trans. Now, tilde associated attorneys work very hard to convince the courts to give their trans clients an exemption on the basis of safety and finances because publication in a newspaper costs money. If you have to do it in New York City, for example, most folks here will tell you to do it with this tiny Irish newspaper in the Bronx that is the cheapest to publish in and one that probably no one you know will read. Luckily for me, I had the nicest court clerk ever. Like not only did he waive publication, he said he was sealing the records and he gave me a little speech about how he respected me for living true to myself, which I overheard him say to all the other trans people that were there changing their names that day. What a gem. I wish I remembered that man's name because he was just wonderful. But consider this an anomaly, not the rule, because my friend Liam went to the same court the week after me and ended up getting a super rude judge who made him publish his name change. So be prepared for the worst, just in case. Also, if you do have to publish, it'll take a week or so to get your court order. If you don't have to publish it, you get it right away. And that certified court order is what all of this was working towards. It is the document you'll need to show everywhere else. And it also costs money, about $6 per copy, at least in New York. And you'll want to get several copies because even though you can just scan it for most places you're gonna change your name at, some offices keep the original you give them. And you just don't wanna risk like your original copy becoming damaged or something. So get a couple of copies. So once I had my certified court order, I was able to take that and my doctor's letter regarding my gender change to the DMV to get a new driver's license. All right, just got back from, oh, hey, there's where that paper clip went. I thought I lost it. I went over to the DMV and I got my new driver's license. I mean, this is my temporary one. Could not have gone better. Uh, I scheduled an appointment and I was a half hour early and they took me right away. I had the MV44 form that you gotta fill out, I had my current driver's license, I had my court ordered name change and my doctor's gender marker letter. That was all I needed. The DMV guy was real funny too. He was he was like, now make sure you change everything else as soon as possible because who knows what Trump is gonna do next. And I was like, yeah dude, <laughs> it's true, that's why I'm here. One step closer! Almost there. And just a quick note on the selective service. I changed my gender to male when I was 26, so I had aged out of selective service. If you are a trans man under 26, regardless of transition status, when you change your gender, you don't have to register for the selective service. But you might occasionally be asked to show documentation proving that you're exempt, like when you apply for a loan or something. And you can get that exemption form on the selective services website, which I will put in the description box. If you are a trans woman under 26, regardless of transition status, or if you have changed your gender, you have to stay on the selective service register. And that includes updating your name with them if you change your name. Now, if the draft ever comes back, you can file an exemption just the same way on the website with that form. And you know, with the current back and forth of if trans people are allowed in the military or not, you probably won't even need to do that, but that is where it all currently stands. I'm gonna put more links to information about trans people and the selective service in the description box. Okay, so once I received my driver's license in the mail, I was able to go get a new social security card and then get a passport and then change everything else. Here is an incomplete list of everything I had to change my name and gender on. Driver's license, social security card, passport, global entry card, municipal ID, bank, student loans, 
health insurance, doctor's office, Patreon, YouTube, Google AdSense, Venmo, PayPal, my email accounts, gas and electric bills, voter registration, gym membership, my checks, because yes, I still use paper checks, UPS, FedEx, and USPS, the library, Today Ticks, all the different employers I had at that time, and anyone I had an open contract with, Amtrak rewards, airline rewards, hotel guest rewards, and I didn't even bother changing all of my, like, neighborhood store points cards. I just let them assume it's my mom or girlfriend's account whenever I use them. Yeah! Changing your name and gender is like when you have to update your address or credit card number with everything that you have an online account for, but even more painstaking because most online accounts, even the most benign ones, don't allow you to change your first name or gender without submitting paperwork to prove you've had a legal change made. Like, a lot of them won't even tell you who to send that paperwork to. You have to call them for them to tell you the email address to send it to. Like, it would save a lot of grief and a lot of people's time if they just listed the email address on the website. Like, I didn't love having to out myself as trans to some stranger on the phone a million times. So I legally changed my name at the start of 2017, and now, nearly two years later, it still pops up. Just this week, I received a check written out to my old name. I get junk mail addressed to my old name all the time. NYU still hasn't changed my name on alumni records despite my repeated requests following the exact instructions they gave on their website. My first school, Southwestern University, by contrast, personally reached out to me within minutes of my original coming out video being posted in 2015, asking if they could update my name and gender in school records. So score one for Southwestern and F you NYU, you are not getting a single donation from me while all of your mail asking me for money still has my old name on it. Anyways, I kept thinking that I would make this video when the whole process was finally finished and I guess it pretty much is, but it took forever to get here. You can do the initial change with the courts and like getting your main IDs updated fairly quickly and painlessly, especially if you work with an organization like Tildef, but all the other tiny things in your life will take a while. It's a big undertaking and just another reason to be totally sure on your name before you change it because, ugh, I at least wouldn't want to have to do all of this all over again. I'm gonna put some resources on all of this in the description box. Please feel free to leave questions in the comments and I or someone else will attempt to answer them. And reminder, again, that we are not lawyers, it's not legal advice, just community sharing. If you like this video, please do subscribe for more videos every Wednesday afternoon. I recently hit my 2018 goal of 50,000 subscribers, which is so wild. I'm gonna do a celebratory Will It Waffle episode as well as a giveaway soon, so watch out for those, and hey, maybe I'll hit 100,000 before we know it and get that sweet, sweet play button. That's all I'm really doing it for, right? If you wanna keep up with what I'm doing beyond YouTube, you know, see my thoughts on current events, good books, whatever, you can follow me at Jack is Not a Bird on Twitter and Instagram. Also, I have merch and a Patreon and a podcast, so check out all of those as well. Links are like on the screen somewhere or at least in the description box. I'm a professional. But that is it for now. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.